Hello, Greg Chun. It is so awesome to have you here on the Coffee and Kareem podcast, and I'm excited and I'm re- really, really grateful to have you here. Thank you so much for giving us some of your time, and uh, I can't wait to learn more about you. Sure thing, Kareem. Thanks for having me. It was just so random, like you, you like um, out of the blue. What were we talking? I think you were talking about Squid Game on Twitter or something like that, and I noticed you because of that. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, because it's been a thing, right? And then you uh, you uh, DM'd me and it sounded like I, I checked out your stuff and I'm like, man, this guy's legit. Yeah, let's talk. Let's see what's Thank going on. Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, I was watching uh, Squid Game and then when I first heard your voice, I was like, I, I think I've heard this voice before. And I, you know, I tweeted out, you responded and I was like flipping out. <laughs> My wife was like, are you okay? <laughs> so <laughs> it, was, it was really, really awesome. And um, for those who don't know, who might not know, uh, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, so I'm Greg. Uh, I am a voice actor um, and a composer here in LA. And I do voices mostly for video games and animation, dubbing, anime, that kind of stuff. Um, and music wise, I write music for mostly TV commercials. And uh, I've worked on some comedy stuff, uh, TV shows, whatnot. But um, I do a mix of things, just try and keep it interesting. But I, I think probably most people know me for the voice work since that's kind of front and center you know, out there. Yeah, and uh, your voice work is incredible. I have to add that. And um, Thank you. I, I wanted to ask you, like, how did you get into voice acting? So it's funny, like I was uh, in grad school, actually, I've been a computer programmer. I was a computer programmer most of my life. So I studied like computer science and I was working at a tech company, like programming computers and this and that. When I first got to L.A., um, well, let me back up. I graduated college up in the Bay Area, and all of the friends that I made during college, you can imagine, were creative types. They were actors, dancers, singers, writers, and they all migrated down to L.A. to get into the business afterwards. And I was sort of left up there by myself, like not by myself, but um, one of the few holdouts who I was working at a safe, stable computer job and everything and um, kind of struggling with the whole thing. Like, do I, I have these creative interests? Do I pursue them or do I do the nice, you know, Asian boy thing and just like got your stable career and stick with that. And so I think after being uh, up there for a while and seeing people starting to make headway in the industry, I kind of was sort of tugging at me a little bit. So I came down. um, But to make the transition, I I started working at DreamWorks as a computer tech, not as a creative person at all. So we were working on a movie called The Prince of Egypt. It's a a long time ago. That's pretty cool. I'm actually a Egyptian. (laughs) Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. I didn't know that. (laughs) That's perfect, yeah. Yeah, so it was the it was my first movie credit. Um, in in and if you watch the very end of the credits, literally like where, like where there's like all the logos and stuff, all the stuff that goes last. I'm like right above there amongst like a sea of people who work this just like, sort of support for the for the uh, film. So basically, what would happen is that the if the machines that the animators were working on the computers like had some issues, I would go fix them. So that was my thing. Um, but. I met a lot of people there who obviously were creative types, a lot of animators, a lot of, you know, this and that. I, you know, Steven Schwartz was working on the music and this was before Wicked and everything. Um, and I got to meet him and actually, you know, hang out in his office and I auditioned for him as a singer. I was a terrible singer back then, so it didn't go anywhere. But um, <laughs> so anyway, uh, I worked at DreamWorks for a while and um I think, you know, I did a lot of theater at night. There was a theater called East West Players down here in L.A., which is an Asian-American theater, uh, doing all sorts of random productions. I would play piano and I did some music directing. I even got up on stage a couple of times, but that wasn't really my main thing. Um, And so I was doing kind of day job theater at night on weekends and then kind of random audio jobs here and there. I started to do a little bit of composing and sound design, but not a ton. So then I had a bit of a like a mid whatever crisis and i was like i can't you know i I don't know if i can handle la all these actors are so weird i need to get out of here and like i'm gonna go uh become a computer science professor so i i i got into grad school down in san diego and i went and my intention was to study computer science and teach be a professor uh, you know a college professor for the rest of my life and so I did that for a few years and I got my master's degree. And then I was thinking about like, am I going to continue this program to become a teacher? Like, how am I feeling right now? And at the time, all of my friends who had, you know, stuck with the grind here in LA were starting to move up. I was, they were giving me calls like, hey, we did a short film you want to write music for or whatever. And I was like, well, I'm in grad school. I'm going to X, Y, and Z. And so I would, I struggled for that for a while. And eventually I was like, you know, I'm 30 something. If I'm going to, give this music career one last shot, I got to go now. So 
I took my master's degree and I got out of there and kind of suspended my uh, the my enrollment in the program there. And I came back and I started working on little shorts and a little bit of reality TV. And then um, I guess one kind of break, you might say, was uh, I was hired as an basically as a coffee boy for the composer for this musical called The Ten Commandments that was at the Kodak Theater back when it was called the Kodak Theater. It's the Dolby Theater now, I think, in Hollywood, um, Hollywood and Highland. So um, <laughs> I was uh, the the composer was a man named Pat Leonard. This brilliant, brilliant. Uh, he's just a genius. He wrote a ton of Madonna hits and produced them and stuff. He's just he's unbelievable. Um, so he wrote the music for this musical, and Val Kilmer was playing Moses. So um, I kind of uh, you know would help Pat like do this and that and go get him coffee and you know keep his notes and whatever. And it was interesting because the production was a little bit all over the place and there wasn't a ton of organization. So um, working with Pat, I decided, well, I'll start taking notes because he would do a lot of arranging and writing and tweaking of the music on the fly with the cast there. And so I figured, well, he probably needs to know what these changes are. you know. And, and as far as everybody else goes, if they have questions, somebody better be writing this down. So I started writing all that down. I started uh, taking down some of his music arrangements that he was just sort of throwing out in his head and notating them so that we knew, okay, this is the harmony here and that's there. So as I got more and more involved, um, eventually I kind of, it became clear that I, well, I made it clear by putting myself in the room and playing, just noodling around that, um, that I played piano. And I had learned the songs um, by that point and was just kind of like if somebody, if, if Pat was late or rehearsal was whatever, I would start warming up the singers on the piano. So eventually Pat's like, oh, you play the piano. And I was like, yeah, 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 I can warm them up for you. It's no problem. Then I think he just, you know, as he got busy with other stuff, and there was a lot of drama in this, in this production, man. But um, as he got busy and taken away and stuff, he would, uh, he would entrust me to like warm up the singers, run them through the first few songs, whatever. So it just kind of, I just started getting more and more involved. And over the period of two months, um, basically kind of went from coffee boy to, uh, you know, note taker, rehearsal pianist, um, assistant music director. And then because the, the, the music director got fired. So then the, that, the assistant music director at the time became the music director. I became the assistant music director. Then the music director got fired. And then they were like, well, are we going to go get a, a real experienced music director or should we just have Greg do it? Like he knows everything, right? So eventually they decided just to make me the music director and the conductor of this musical. And so I stepped into this role, uh, not really knowing what I was getting into. I mean, I had worked for smaller productions, but this was kind of a new thing. And so um, I took on the role and ended up conducting this show for two and a half months or whatever, for however long it ran at the, at the, at the theater. So long story short, the reason I'm telling you all this is because one of the lead roles, uh, one of the lead actors, her name was uh, Nita Whitaker. And she was, uh, she's an incredible singer. She, you remember that show Star Search? Not the recent one, but the way back in the day one with Ed McMahon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Ed McMahon, the guy with the glasses, that's classic. Um, so uh, you're too young to remember that uh, for real. But he, um, she was one of the like Star Search $100,000 vocalist winners one year, right? She's an amazing singer. It just so happens her husband was a man by the name of Don LaFontaine. And Don LaFontaine, when it came to trailers and voiceover, he was the king for a as long as he was alive. He was the guy who, when everybody thinks of, in a world where one man, like, he's the guy. He was the guy, right? <laughs> and so I met Don through Nita, through working on this show. And we kind of hit it off and stuff. And, you know, I... Uh, I, I would go help him out with his computers, you know, because, you know, this is voiceover stuff and music. There's all these computers involved. I would go help him when he had problems and this and that. And eventually he invited me in to play poker with him and his buddies and become a regular part of the game. And so his buddies were all these voiceover titans, right? These voiceover guys who were in animation and promo and trailers and this and that. And so I actually met one night my who became my first agent. I met at that poker night, right? So... It was just this haphazard turn of events that just kind of resulted in me uh, finding my way. And I, um, you know, after I started writing music for commercials, you know, there's always voiceover in commercials going like, Target, this weekend, there's a sale, blah, blah, blah. 
And I, you know, when you're as a composer, you go kind of crazy. It's a very isolating profession. And so I'd be sitting here watching this commercial a billion times over, writing the music for it. And I would hear this voiceover over and over and over. Come to Target this weekend for 10% off. And so you start talking to yourself. You start imitating it. You start doing this and that. And that was another thing that clued me into like, you know, this is somebody's getting paid a lot of money to do this, <laughs> you know. And so um, I at some point with this, all of these things swirling around in my head, I decided to start studying. And I, I, I started taking classes. I got a private coach and I really went at it hard to train myself because in the beginning I was not good at all. You know, it's, it's something that you can have instincts for, but you really got to train. You have to train um, because their idiosyncrasies about the work, the voiceover work, as opposed to an, on camera acting or, or whatever other creative you know endeavor you might be um, already well versed in. There's these nuances that you have to get that you got to sort of master in order to be able to do the job. So I studied, I coached, I this and that. Eventually, I got an agent, and it just kind of went from there. Once you get an agent, then you can start auditioning for the higher profile uh, projects. And once those clients work with you, and if they like you, then they can start bringing you back. And eventually word gets around. It takes time. But, uh, you know, I started pursuing voiceover maybe in 2009. And uh, I didn't start regularly working until 2016. So it's, it's, yeah, the first three years, my voiceover, I was operating at a big loss because it was all coaches, classes, demos, you know, promotion and make and not getting hired. You know what I mean? Uh and then can you imagine seven years before I really started, you know, it was three years before I would turn a profit at the end of the year. And the first year, the profit was like $800. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was something obscene. Um, and then eventually, 2016, I started uh, making enough that I could think about making it a real part of my business, you know. So that is to say that it's something that I think a lot of people have the impression like, oh, voiceover, that sounds fun. I can talk. I can yell. And they expect to just jump on in, like, and all of a sudden be able to jump ship from whatever career they had going and do it. And it, and you know, the best of the best, they'll always, everyone will tell you, anyone in this business will tell you, it took me, you know, five, six, seven, ten years to to be able to drop everything else. And yeah. that's incredible. That's really, really inspirational. And it kind of proves the point, like, you know, sometimes they tell you don't quit because you might be you might be there you know you never know it's, it's you're probably just right right around the corner from getting to the position that you want and um so after that like uh what was like your first voiceover role that you got like oh so i mean the first one of note because the thing is when i started pursuing there were these little random like non-union video games that have like you know, you've got a little character and it's got like three lines and whatever. The first note, real yeah. work. Note, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The first real work that I did. And this is a funny story, too, because I got my coach um, and uh, we had been studying. And eventually she's like, I have an I have a relationship with an agency I'd like to introduce you to. Uh, they're here in the building. I said, oh, OK. So she basically walked me over there um, and said, why don't you uh, why don't you read for them? And they they uh, they talked to her and they're like, OK, cool. Yeah, well, if you think he's decent we'll we'll listen to him so i walk in the door and there's the guy that i played poker with like five years ago right <laughs> over at don's place and i was just like ilko like what <laughs> what are you doing here um and that was it so that was my audition so they said come on in we just had something come in today why don't you read for it and i was like okay cool that sounds good so they plopped this down in front of me and it's world of warcraft it's a role from world of warcraft um from the, uh, it just so happened that the expansion Mists of Pandaria had just it started rolling, and they were auditioning actors for it. And it also just so happened that they wanted a light Asian accent to all of these auditions, right? So that was another real uh, stroke of luck for me. Is that is you know how it is? You don't necessarily want to have people of color doing other people of color's accents, or you know Caucasian actors doing people of color's accents, a very sensitive topic. And back then it was, it was starting to get very sensitive as well. And so um, it was an opportunity for me to come in and say, hey, look, you know, this is, this is authentic-ish. <laughs> I'm Asian American, but you know what I mean? Um, and so I came in and I read for it and I booked it. And I was like, this is gonna be easy. Like I got my agent, I'm working for Blizzard, like everything's cool. Dude, I didn't book another union job for a year and a half after that a year and a half auditioning every week, right? 
And that's another because it's one thing like to to you you pursue the craft and you you start working, but then there's these dry spells, right? And like as an actor, you go freaking nuts during that time. You're just like, whoa, 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 I suck. Like, what am I? Nobody's buying what I'm selling. What's happening here? And it, it's one of those things that you just have to love it so much that you're willing to either persevere or put up with how shitty you feel or whatever to get through it and keep doing it. So um, it was very humbling. Very, very humbling because, you know, you book your job like that and you think you're on easy street. No way, man. You always got to be on your game. I'm always working to improve. I watch everything that I do. You know, if I don't actually play the game, I'll watch YouTube videos of it and be like, how was that? Could I have done that better? Like that didn't really work. Remember that for next time. Like I'm always dissecting every everything that I do, every piece of work. I do. That's really interesting. Um, and actually, uh, from the community, I asked also there's like a like a, a huge community of um, you know that follow you that are fans and I asked them if they had any questions and it kind of flows into it like you know why do you work so much they because now it's like it's, it's, you just explained it how much of a grind you put into this and how much you you really really um, put in so much work to get to where you are because that was one of the questions why do you think you work so much and I think you answered it pretty much <laughs> <laughs> I mean I you know, I work because I love my work, and I'm sure you do too. A, a lot of creative folks, we all love what we do. I think the tricky part is, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. It's just what we do, but it's the tricky part is getting somebody who's going to pay you to do it. <laughs> you know, anybody can have passion and do whatever all day long, but can you live on it? You know what I mean? And so, um, excuse me. So, like, I work my ass off because I love what I do. Now, uh, obviously, there is work life balance, and that's very important. Um, but, uh, you do it cause you love it. And, and I think the key to me in my music career in my voiceover career, everything that I've ever done, the key to getting called back and, and, you know, continuing to work for the clients you've worked for is just, uh, and a lot of people say this, this is very simple. Just don't be an asshole. You know what I mean? You, you have your talent, you know, your base level of talent to do the job, right? Um, and then there's everything else. There's your professionalism. Are you on time? Are you easy to work with? Are you, do you make a big deal out of things that are not a big deal? Do you cause problems rather than provide solutions? Like all this stuff is, is essential if you want to keep working in the business. You know why? Because there's so many, the, as far as talent goes, there's people, there's, there's a line around the globe of people who are talented enough to do the job that you're doing, right? And what's going to have them choose you over to them because they like you. They like hanging out with you. You know, it's, it, you know, I, I, as a composer, I hire musicians, I hire singers. And this goes for, uh, you know, this goes for everybody, I think, who's in position to hire. You'd much rather work with somebody who's maybe not quite as brilliant as far as talent goes, but who's fun and easy and nice and not a pain in the ass. You know what yeah, I mean? Makes absolute sense. Yeah. Totally. And so it's one thing if you just want to be, you know, this brilliant person who goes down in history of, uh, of being just off the off the charts, like a, just an inhumanly, um, that's not, I don't even know if that's a word, whether you want to go down in history as somebody who is just uh, beyond, you know, transcendent when it comes to your level of talent, or if you want to work and you want to have relationships in this business and you want to build a, a body of work that you can you can look back on when you're older yeah you know? yeah yeah it's, so, it's, it must I, be awesome yeah to like leave something behind. i really prioritize uh you know i prioritize being uh being an asset and trying not to be a liability in any way and trying to ha bring like a positive spirit and have everybody have fun making the work because sometimes you got to work real hard you know there's a game called isomnium files um that i worked on and my last recording session because of a deadline was 14 hours. It was 14 hours long. And like we were all, the engineer, the director, the client, me, we were all dying by the end of this thing. We finished at like three in the morning. <laughs> but it had to get done, so. You and know. you got it done, man. And, and you know, yeah, it it's, I'm, I'm pretty sure like with all these different uh, jobs, especially in your voice acting career, um, what was your favorite out of all of them? <clears throat> My favorite role. Um, my favorite role will always be, uh, Yagami, 
There's just no question about that. Um, you know, that was my first real lead role. And that was, there's something about that. It's like that whole, like, you never forget your first time. That's true for everything, right? It's like Cirque du Soleil. Whichever Cirque du Soleil you see first, that's your favorite, even though everyone will, like, fight you tooth and nail that this other one is better. It's the same thing. Like, my first real protagonist role, and I, <clears throat> I got, when I saw the auditions for it, and I auditioned for like every character in Judgment. If you listen to my auditions for these other characters, they are horrible. They don't sound anything like the character. And like, <laughs> you know, you listen to the people who did them, you know, like Keith Silverstein and freaking Crispin and everybody. And they did, they're, uh, they're so much better for those roles, right? But luckily, they saw me, or they heard me as Yagami. And even when I saw the auditions, they came in, you know, they show like the pictures of the character you're auditioning for. And then there's the whole description and then the audition lines. So all of the roles like, you know, Hoshino, Kaito, <clears throat> you know, Shioya and uh, freaking, um, what's, what's, what's Mercer's role? I always forget um, Matt's, the, the, well, we shouldn't talk about spoilers anyway. Um, they show, <laughs> they show about, um, they show uh, the picture of the person that you're auditioning for and then all of the other information. And Yagami's picture on these audition sides, there was something different about it because all of the rest of them were just like a nice computer rendering of the face. For Yagami's audition picture, it was that splash screen in the beginning with the red and yellow and the blue smoke and the, he's sort of silhouetted and walking at the screen. The, the very beginning, the menu screen for Judgment, that was the picture for him. And I was like, this guy looks freaking cool, man. Hell yeah. <laughs> I, and from the audition copy, I'm like, I wonder if this guy is the lead role. Like, this is the one that I want. This is the one that I want. And it is the one that resonated the most with me during the audition process. Like, for some reason, just the monologue itself, um, it felt like it felt right to me. So when I got the call back and saying, hey, you've been cast in this game, I was like, okay, cool, cool. Like, who is it? Who did they bring? Who did they cast me as? I don't know. And I wasn't familiar with the Yakuza franchise at all, mind you, at this point. So I didn't even know what this game was. I just thought that the picture looked really cool. So I go in for the first day and they're just like, um, you know, I go into PCB and um, Keith is there and Scott from Sega is there. And they're like, well, let me, let's, let's show you who you're playing. So they bring up the menu screen for Judgment. And like Yagami's got his jacket on. He's silhouetted. He's got his blue smoke and he's walking in slow motion. He's like, that's your guy. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me, man? That is super cool. I was like, that is, I'm like, so this is like the, oh, is this is just like the, the main character of the game? And they're like, yep. I'm like, okay. All right, there you go. And it was just, <clears throat> it was just such an experience, man. Like you can't even imagine. We start recording this guy and I'm like, how many, because like, mind you, every, the longest recording session I've had for any game before that, I think was maybe four hours I recorded for a character and I asked them how many sessions are we how many sessions are we doing for this guy like how many sessions do we need to record this game and they said well we're estimating about like we're estimating about 60 hours of recording total <laughs> and I was like what but you're like you're in every scene so it was um you know getting to work on the game uh the actual casting audition process was all very very surreal and very very emotional for me the actual process was so much fun working with pcb and with sega and stuff um me and scott and keith and dan we were like the you know the four musketeers in the studio there getting through this game having a great time like there's you know the yakuza and judgment franchises they there's a lot of serious stuff in there right it has a lot of heart and it gets very dark but then there is some stuff that is just absurd. I mean, it's just ridiculous and so silly, right? And so we would have the best time, like, just screwing around, um, you know, and, and getting the job done. So that process was amazing. And then when the, when the game was going to be released, they sent me on this whole, like, promotion tour. They sent me to London. They sent me to E3 um, and San Francisco and stuff like that. And we just, uh, you know, I got to do all this promotion and meet all these people and do these events. And so it was the whole experience was so unforgettable uh, and, and just like nothing I'd ever experienced. There's no way that I'll, that that'll always be the, the role that's nearest and dearest to my heart, you know, for forever. I mean, congratulations on that, first of all. And Thank you. Um, there's something really special about voice actors in video games, like uh, Snake, you know, you, you got David Hayter, uh, Nolan North, you got um, uh, Nathan Drake, and, and Greg Chun. 
Yagami. Like whenever we see Yagami, <laughs> we, we hear him. That's like your Yagami. You know what I mean? It's like um, it's just really cool. It's something I think is is growing on a lot of people because it's it's a new form uh, of appreciation for the art. You know, um, you know, I, I love that voice acting that was being truly respected and and then form of entertainment. You know, uh, when it comes to that. Yeah. I it's it's a cool time you know i think especially with uh with pandemic and all that kind of stuff like they, they there was some statistic that like video game consoles and video game sales were up like some absurd amount because people were bored and staying at home and stuff and that's true that's true yeah you know who's your favorite character from the judgment series besides yagami of course besides yagami that's a good question I mean, I think it might have to be Kaito, honestly. Although, gosh, that's that Kaito's not Kaito's not as great. And obviously, he and I, you know, had so many scenes together and and all the bantering stuff. But freaking Hamura is hilarious too, just because whenever Fred Tatasciu opens his mouth, you just like his hair just gets blown back. You know, he's got such a there's something so hypnotic about him. You can honestly just listen to him read anything, and it's uh, you know. But yeah, I'd have to go with Kaito-san. He's he's my bud. You that's know. a good choice that's a good choice got another question yeah, from yeah. the community and they ask is there anything you've learned through seeing the reception of the first judgment or anything from playing nanba in yakuza like a dragon which you also voice that you brought into last judgment to really enhance your performance of yagami you know that's a that's actually a really good question because because the fact that i wasn't super familiar with the yakuza franchise before i started working on judgment as I got to know Judgment going through, and then as I, especially working on Like a Dragon, because that goes even, that even takes it to another level when it comes to just sort of like having fun, being silly, uh, and doing that sort of absurdist thing, right? Um, the pigeon attack. It's just like, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. Um, as I got more familiar with that, it's almost like you see stuff like that and you're like, oh, okay, that's how we're playing it now. Like that's, that, that's what we're doing here. So I think for Lost Judgment, I was able to embrace kind of the silly moments with a little bit more uh, familiarity with what the vibe is. And so, yeah, I, it helped me, all of this experience with, the, um, with these characters is helping me kind of gel into the franchise in general, I think more and more as, as it goes along. And so, um, Lost Judgment, I made sure that, you know, I was just more comfortable doing Lost Judgment because it wasn't so new. And I did know kind of the character and sort of what the deal was. But then the experience with Namba helped me embrace more like, you know, when we're having a silly moment, you know, go for it. Don't don't feel like, you know, you necessarily need to temper how it is that you that you embrace it or whatever. Just just go. And so in a lot of ways, it helped Lost Judgment be a very, very organic and very uh, kind of natural experience that I didn't really need to think about a whole lot. You know? Nice, nice. Did you play uh, the Judgment or Yakuza series on your own? Uh, yeah, I streamed. I streamed Judgment. Um, uh, let's see, when was it? I streamed Judgment, and then I streamed Ghost of Tsushima, and then now I'm streaming Lost Judgment. Um, I'm gonna do Like a Dragon, I think, after um, after I finish Lost Judgment. But um, yeah, and so it's um, I get too distracted with things like mahjong and and like uh, you know, darts, <laughs> no, the mini games. Yeah, they're <laughs> awesome. They're awesome. Yeah, they're, they're so fun. Yeah. Um, and uh, but you know, I think because Judgment, I pretty much like I panicked because I knew that Ghost of Tsushima, um, the DLC was coming out, and I play a character named Tenzo in that. Another so phenomenal game. By the way. Oh, Ghost! Thank you. And Ghost is Sucker Punch. Man, they are nuts. Man, they are on. I started playing that game, and even from the very first scene, the detail on the faces, yeah. and the nuances of the acting, like it's yeah. just next level. Just blew my head. Yeah, and the combat, super fun too, just super hilarious. Um, so I was playing Judgment. I started to panic because I was, I was thinking, okay, I, I don't want to just like jump into the DLC because I, I heard you have to finish a couple chapters of Ghost before you can get to the DLC. So I had to finish up Judgment quickly. So I, I said, okay, no more Mahjong. <laughs> I'm gonna finish the story. Um, and get through that so that I could start streaming Ghost. I did that, and I was rushing to finish that before Lost Judgment came out. So now that Lost Judgment came out, I think I've got a little breathing room. I'm going to do a lot of side quests and stuff because it's fun to voice the side quests because they're not a lot of them are not voiced, right? So I'll actually I'll voice my lines that are there just written. Um, and once I get through that, then um, you know we'll see we'll see we'll see what's next. Sounds good. And then let's jump really quick to Squid Game the hottest thing right now on Netflix. Good game. <laughs> yeah. Tell us a little bit about that and uh, your character. 
So Squid Game, um, how does Squid Game come about? I think the studio just contacted me at some point. And um, there's a, a, a director named Carrie Karanen that I worked for uh, on numerous projects. Her and I have a really good uh, relationship and we work, you know, we have sort of a shorthand between the, between the two of us. We work on a lot of dubs together, the Carrie directs. And I think um, she may have turned me on to the director, Madeline uh over at the studio and so one day i just got sent these audition sides and i i sent, i auditioned for both gyun uh gyun and sangwoo right and so i turned in my i i should go back and listen to what my sangwoo audition sounded like <laughs> i'm curious um but uh i sent them in and then next thing i knew i just you know a few days later got an email from my agent saying hey they want you for for uh gyun i'm like oh okay cool sounds good um and what's funny too is that I thought at the time that uh, Sangwoo was the lead of the show, right? And so, um, you know, obviously he's he's significant principal character and stuff like that. But I didn't realize that uh, that the that the game or that the show was kind of focused around Keon. So, um, I got that and I was like, oh, great, sounds great. That that was a super fun audition too. So I went in and we started recording and. We get to the end of the first episode because, you know, up until the point in the first episode where it takes a little bit of a wicked turn, it's just like, oh, I'm down on my luck. I'm gambling. I'm kind of a loser or whatever. And I'm like, oh, this is fun. And we had a lot of fun recording, you know, uh, Gion's lines, this happy-go-lucky sort of loser dude who mooches his office of his mom and whatever. Then we get to that part of the episode. I'm like, holy shit, dude. Like, what is this show about? Like, it, it, you know, we get to that scene. I was like, okay. I guess this is what it is. And so from that point on, I was like, I got to know what happens next. And it was painful because, you know, when you're a, a viewer, you can binge it as long as you can stay awake, right? As an actor, when you're working on it, it's like, okay, well, we don't have the episodes for the next one for another two weeks. I'm like, I got to wait two weeks to find out what happens with this thing, right? So, so yeah, I was hooked and I, I was, um, I knew it was going to be an amazing job and a lot of really gratifying to work on right and so um you know that was it i just did the job and i you know what i didn't know obviously didn't know it was going to be this huge thing like you do your job you're like i really love this show i hope people like it so um you do it and then i'm as i'm uh you know my wife and i watch a lot of korean dramas so we got squid game promotion pretty i think immediately when it dropped you know you turn on netflix and it shows you what's coming and like squid game I'm like oh this is the show that I worked on. And I had no idea it was going to be called Squid Game, by the way. Because, you know, when we work on these projects, they have code names. So it was code name, whatever, banana peel. And so um, this thing comes out. I'm like, Squid Game, that looks interesting. I'm like, oh, shit, that's the show that I worked on. <laughs> yeah, and so, and I, it was cool. And I told my wife, I'm like, I can't wait to watch. I'm like, you can't watch this. You're not going to like it. Like, it's, it's really grotesque. And she's like, yeah, maybe I'll, maybe I'll pass on that one. But um and then it like became this thing and people are, you know, my Twitter starts kind of blowing up. I'm like, why is it like, why am, what are all these alerts? And I go out, I'm like, everybody's talking about freaking Squid Game. <laughs> and so it's, uh, it's crazy, but it's one of those happy accidents that, you know, I think as voice actors and as artists in general, like you want somebody to give a crap about what you do. And when people actually pay attention to what you do and, and, you know, and God willing, they appreciate it. It's, uh, that's the, you know. 90% of the reward in this business. So it's been wonderful. That's awesome. And uh, you also play a lot of other characters that I enjoyed, but we won't get into them, but I'll just mention them. Ike from Smash Bros. I see, I see you got him in the back Ike. there. Um, yeah. Ren from Shenmue 3. Uh, Shenmue is one of my favorite games. That's what got me into the Yakuza series, actually. Is so, that right? Yeah. Yeah. Shenmue. So, yeah. So that's pretty cool. And um, I just want to say thank you so much for your time. And uh, and I just oh, wanted... Of course, man. It's my pleasure. Before I actually forget, um, any words of encouragement for up-and-coming voice actors who are looking to follow your footsteps? Definitely, yeah. The uh, Where I would start, and what, this is what I tell every voice actor who's wanting to get into the business, there's a website called IWantToBeAVoiceActor.com. You go there, and it is the definitive primer on what this business is about, what it really takes and what it is that you got to do if you want to make headway in it. If you're serious about working, go to that site and just devour the whole thing. There's a a, a legendary voice actor. His name is D. Bradley Baker. Um, he does everything 
but he's he's very especially known for the fact that anytime you hear like a creature or any type of like you know chittering little critter or whatever that's not really a human it's him right so he he does you know i mean he's he's got a gazillion roles of all kinds but he is the go-to guy in town for that stuff um and so whenever they need some type of animal or some type of alien or whatever he just makes these if you could check out videos of him and how he makes his uh comes up with these sounds it's amazing you know he twists his face up he'll use like a bottle he'll do all sorts of stuff it's very very cool d bradley baker he maintains this site and he updated it for covid times and everything it is where everyone needs to start. And I think the most important thing about it is that it preps people for the reality of it, that there is the creative passion of it all. There's also the business part of it all. And how is it that you can actually get to a point where this is your job and how do you live? You know, um, it's a very, very, very valuable, uh, it's a wealth of information there. So go there, understand. Uh, for me personally, it all starts with acting training, classes, coaching improv classes as well right can't get enough of that stuff and just being prepared for how long it might take for you know for you to end up on a triple a video game title just be just be for for actors i think uh it's important to keep in mind that you know as cliche as it sounds it's a marathon not a sprint and it takes time it takes time even if you are the most talented person on the planet it takes time for you to work into the system and for people to know who you are agents studios they've got their rosters they've got their go-to people how is it that you're going to crack in and make a splash you know a lot of it is luck and timing you just got to be patient and ready to slog through a dry spell of a year and a half where you're not getting any jobs yeah <laughs> definitely I mean? and one more yeah. thing a request if you can say in yagami's voice i'm uh takuki yagami and um you're watching kareem jovian that would be so cool. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right, everyone. Thanks for joining. I'm Takayuki Yagami, and you're watching Kareem Jovian. Oh, man, that was awesome. Thank you so much, Greg, John, and I appreciate it. And hopefully we see more of you and hear more of you. And um, looking forward to your future and success. Thank you so much for Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem, Absolutely. man. Thank you for, like, for giving us your time and coming through. And until next time. For sure. See ya. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye, bro.